programming paradigms are tricky to talk about, mainly because the paradigm doesn't matter very much at very small scales. And when talking about code, the examples that we use are for practical reasons nearly always at very small scales. So I can say that paradigm X has these nice properties or these unpleasant ones, but as well as just being my opinion, it's also pretty difficult to demonstrate. So here's my opinionated view of why object orientation is a good paradigm. Not the only paradigm, not even the best for some kinds of things perhaps, but a good one nevertheless. So what is OO and what are the benefits that it delivers? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. Uh, if you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus and Specflow. They're all helping us to develop our channel. So please do click on their links in the description below in response. If you like my videos and if you'd like to learn more about continuous delivery, test driven development and software engineering in general, I have a range of training courses that can help. Check out my training site in, in the link in the description. In a previous video, I compared object orientation and functional approaches to programming. In this episode, let's look specifically at OO. We should probably start by looking at what OO really is. Wikipedia defines OO as a programming paradigm based on the concept of objects, which contain data and code. Data in the form of fields, often known as attributes or properties, and code in the form of procedures, often known as methods. Well, that's okay, but it doesn't really actually say very much beyond the fact that we have some kind of modular structure that includes code and data. There's an important corollary of that though, um, a link between the code and data. Um, OO has two foundational concepts. First, we have the shape, how this code and data is organized. The code, the variables, the structure of the data that it deals with, how this thing actually works. In OO, we call this a class. And then we have a specific version of a class identified by specific data values. This is an object also referred to as an instance of that class. So you and I can both have an account. Our accounts work in exactly the same way. They're always changed in the same way and they store their state in the same way, perhaps. But your account is different to mine. If you add a euro to your account, I don't get your euro. So they're different things. Your account is one object and my account is another. Although both of these objects are instances of the class account. They both exhibit the same degree of accountness, if you like. This is handy because I can now write code that deals with both your account and my account without knowing anything about the differences between them. That ought to allow us to move quite quickly, raising the level of abstraction in our code so that I can write code that doesn't care about how accounts actually work inside, where the data is stored, or even importantly, whether your account is actually the same as my account on the inside. This gets us to the next big idea in object orientation, polymorphism. What if we changed how my account worked but left yours alone? To the outside world, to the code that deals with the accounts, they all look just like accounts. But inside, my account is now different to yours in some way. This is one form of information hiding. As a consumer of accounts, you don't need to know anything about how they work. You only need to know how to talk to them. That means that we can change how they work without changing how we talk to them. And so make much more flexible and much more extensible code. You can get some version of this with APIs over functions, but classes allow us to achieve this information hiding at different resolutions of detail. Also, this separation of interface and implementation is an idea that is pretty closely linked with OO historically. So even when we do do this for non-OO things, 
it was nearly always prompted by OO thinking. A good example of this that springs to my mind is something like a printer driver. I think of this with some historical justification as an OO concept. An operating system presents an abstraction for printing. It defines a class that defines all, of the, all that you need to know if you want to print something. It defines how you talk to your printer in effect. But it doesn't say anything at all about how your printer actually works. Early operating systems didn't really do this, but when GUIs came along, graphical user interfaces, they were consciously OO. Xerox PARC, where the GUI was invented, was also where Alan Kay worked and Alan invented OO. OO was a central concept in the invention of GUIs. So in the first GUIs, they provided this abstraction for printing. This predefined interface allows me to plug in some code that talks to a specific model of printer. The printer and driver embody state, so this is a thing with both state and behavior, an object. We can create printer drivers that implement this abstraction. Our driver can make the printer work any way that makes sense, but it doesn't expose any of these technicalities. It hides them behind our printing abstraction. I remember a printer driver that used to store jobs to be printed as files in a directory on the file system. A second, completely separate process trawled the folder on the disk looking for things to print. But no one who used this printer driver knew anything about this or cared. Before object orientation, if I wanted to print something, I needed to know the exact details of the printer that I wanted to use and write code that talked directly to it in each application that needed to print things. After OO, I could ignore the differences and simply tell the printer to print. All modern operating systems have adopted this idea of polymorphism and taken it to their hearts. OO is foundational to graphical user interfaces. As I said, they were designed that way from the beginning. The code that organizes the windows on your system doesn't care what they do. The code that decides where to put a list box or a button on a web page doesn't know what's in the list or what happens when you press the button. These are OO ideas. I can have two instances of button, same class, same code. I can interact with them in maybe sophisticated ways without knowing or caring anything about how they work or what they represent. What this means for larger systems is that we can establish and, and operate at different levels of abstraction in different parts of the system. Even in a simple web application, the DOM and the UI controls don't know and don't care what they're being used for. By the way, remember that DOM stands for Document Object Model. This is such a useful approach that we don't usually even think of writing these sorts of things ourselves anymore unless we've got some unusual needs. That wasn't really how stuff worked before object orientation. Whatever the programming paradigm of your preferred programming language these days, it probably has things like collections, strings, and other complex types. These are classes, and the specific instances are objects. Now, I think it's fair, a fair criticism of my argument here that some of this is just about us growing up as a discipline. As software development got bigger, we've learned more about how to write code, how to share existing stuff, and how to build on top of the work of other people. That may well be separate to OO and OO thinking, but in reality, that isn't how it happened. These things happened in the context of OO, and so all were influenced by it. So it's very difficult to disentangle the evolution of our discipline from object orientation because OO was and still is a big and important part of that evolution. So if some extremist faction of procedural or functional programmers took over the world in some weird invasion of the object snatchers and banned OO, they'd also be banning Windows, Mac OS X, Unix, significant parts of the public cloud, the JVM, .NET, web browsers, and the World Wide Web. In recent years, OO has gone somewhat out of fashion, at least on the core kids table. But I think it does some things that other paradigms don't. 
And I think that many of the criticisms of OO stem from two things that aren't really anything to do with OO as a practice and would be equally true if Prolog or Haskell had taken over the world instead of Java and Python. The first I mentioned in the introduction. OO shines most brightly when the code is big and complex. Not only because of the compartmentalization that I've already mentioned, but also because OO gives us something extra. Something that is important in big code bases. The ability to find our way around. The second problem is that OO has been consistently the dominant paradigm for the past 20 years. That is, if we go by language popularity. Incidentally, there's a, lovely anima a link to a lovely animation showing the most popular programming languages from the 1960s to the present day in the description below. What the fact of OO's dominance means is that if you are looking for good, bad or indifferent examples in code, you'll find examples of them all out there. There's a good YouTube video called OO Programming is Embarrassing that does just this. I'd argue that the examples in that video are just bad code and not very OO in design. But in saying this, uh, as the presenter of this video points out, I do rather sound like I'm just saying OO is fine as long as you do it better, which I suppose in part I am. Bad programming is worse than good programming, whatever your programming language. And as I've said here before, you can write crap code in any language and any paradigm. At the level of code examples that work in a YouTube video, I think that the criticism of OO made in the vi this video is fair. Probably simpler to write these small examples as procedural code. What this misses, though, is what happens when the problem is bigger than this. What happens when the problem is big enough that it won't all fit inside your head anymore? You can think of an object as simply a bunch of functions. And that's certainly true, though a bit oversimplistic. But OO adds some more ideas that help us to organize those functions. We have modules. Other paradigms have modules too. But we also have classes. Classes are a specialized additional form of module. Classes allow us to define the way in which we expect code to interact with them. But they also allow us to name our abstractions. These names are in addition to the names of our functions, so they give us a way of talking and thinking about our code at a different level of abstraction from the detail of the functions alone. This allows us to talk about ideas like accounts or shopping carts, and for these things to have a concrete representation in our code. This ability is kind of fractal. We can talk about fine-grained classes like strings, money, 3D points or buttons, and we, then we can think about higher level things like accounts, customers and orders. But we can also apply this at coarser grain service level ideas, maybe something like order processing, stock control or registration. Then we can think of massive ideas. I once worked with a team where nearly every test that we ran began by creating a hospital and then populating it with a fleet of medical devices. We could also achieve this kind of navigability with modules rather than just classes, but then we have lost polymorphism. By separating the external contract from the internal implementation, classes allow the kind of substitution that I described earlier. We can start by creating a simple, even trivial version of even very complex things. The hospitals that we created in our tests that I mentioned earlier started as little more than a named thing that acted as in effect as a namespace for everything else so that our tests could run in isolation of other tests. In, it later grew to be a complex thing, but the things that relied on it as a namespace early on still could, even as it continued to evolve. This is not impossible in other paradigms, but I think it is more difficult. And where it is not, that's usually because they've taken some good ideas from OO. I value this navigability very highly in OO systems. Again, I must accept that some of this is probably just my bias. I've spent the majority of my career working on mostly complex systems and using OO to do it. But I think that there is more than only my prejudice at play here. 
I've said on this channel many times that our job as software developers is not to write code, it's to solve problems. I think that OO is a profoundly powerful tool in helping us to solve problems. The multi-layered tools it offers for abstraction allow us to deal with tiny details as well as large-scale concepts. The tools for labeling ideas by naming them as classes and as operations functions on those classes allows us to imagine designs and ideas while ignoring the detail. Again, at nearly every different resolution of detail that we care about. There's one more thing that I'd like to mention. That is the modeling of the systems that we build. As you can probably already tell from the way that I've described it, OO is a, as much about the way that we think about the problems that we solve as it is about the code that we write. But that doesn't mean that it's abstract and divorced from the code. When I first heard about Eric Evans' book, Domain Driven Design, a book that I really admire, I confess that I thought, isn't this just OO? Object orientation was originally thought of in the context of simulation, writing code that simulated complex things. It was meant to help bridge the gap between those complex ideas and the code that we wrote to simulate them. At least in part, that's how I've always thought about code ever since I learned how to do it. My aim when designing code is to try and simulate the problem that I'm trying to solve in code. This is very, very closely related and part of domain-driven design thinking. OO helps us to bridge the gap between the problem that we are solving and the solutions that we create in the code. If you have a concept of an account or an order book in your problem, we'd be rather dumb not to create accounts and order book classes to represent those ideas in our code. A lot of the criticism that I see of object orientation does read to me rather as criticism of bad programming rather than of OO. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of bad software written in OO languages out there. Despite that, OO is a powerful set of tools, but it doesn't make software development simple. That's because software development isn't simple, except for the most trivial of cases. Coding sometimes is simple, but software development is certainly not. Software development is a complex activity and OO is, at least in my opinion, one of the most powerful tools to help us accomplish it. Even if it does demand of us a fair degree of thoughtfulness and doesn't magically make bad programmers great. Thank you very much for watching.